Have you ever thought about defining the term freedom? It can be more difficult than you might at first think. Friedrich Nietzsche defined the term freedom, and he gave it a definition that was consistent with anarchist philosopher Max Stern. Tennessee and welcome to the Monte Carlo Report. If you'd like to get a copy of my free theological journal, then contact me at the email address that you see at the beginning of this video. I'll send one out to you free of charge. Friedrich Nietzsche moves from subject to subject in his writings. He discusses many philosophical ideas classified under epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, politics, aesthetics, and so on. One important and interesting topic Nietzsche discusses is the definition of freedom. Many people in our day and age often discuss freedom without ever really considering what the word actually means. Nietzsche defines the term freedom when he writes, and I quote, For what is freedom? To have the will to be responsible for oneself? To keep the distance which separates us? To become more indifferent to hardship, severity, privation, and even to life? To be ready to sacrifice men for one's cause? oneself not accepted? Freedom implies that manly instincts, instincts which delight in war and triumph, dominate over their instincts. For example, over instincts of happiness. The man who has become free treads underfoot the contemptible species of well-being dreamt of by shopkeepers, Christians, cows, women, Englishmen, and other Democrats. The free man is a warrior. The people who were worth something, who became worth something, never acquired their greatness under liberal institutions. Great danger made something out of them which deserves reverence. Danger which first teaches us to know our resources, our virtues, our shield and sword, our genius, which compels us to be strong. First principle, men must require strength. Otherwise, they never attain it. Those great forcing houses for the strong, the strongest species of man that has hitherto existed, the aristocratic commonwealths of the patterns of Rome and Venice, understood freedom precisely in the sense in which I understand the word, as something which one has and has not, as something which one desires which one wins by conquest." End quote. Twilight of the Idols, Roving Expeditions of an Inopportune Philosopher, section 38, pages 59 through 60. Now in the fourth video of this series, we've already examined a quotation from Nietzsche, also from his book Twilight of the Idols, where he clearly denies any sense of human responsibility. So when Nietzsche defines freedom as a man having the will to be responsible for oneself, then we cannot help but shake our heads at this obvious contradiction. Nietzsche simply means that freedom is not being ashamed to do what one desires. It is to act boldly and proudly. Freedom for Nietzsche has nothing to do with responsibility, but the rest of his remarks make this all too evident. Next, Nietzsche wants to include an increasing indifference to hardship, severity, privation, and even life to the concept of freedom. Now, as Christians, we believe the Bible, and we strive to glorify God despite the presence of hardship, severity, and privation. Quote, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. End quote. See Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Even so, this does not mean that we are indifferent to the presence of hardship in the lives of others. The Bible teaches, and I quote, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not please ourselves. End quote. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. Nietzsche, to the contrary, is teaching that the powerful elite few are to be indifferent to the sufferings of the many. I really don't think Nietzsche is here giving us a definition of freedom. Instead, I believe he's telling us what it means to be a sociopath. Continuing with his twisted view of freedom, Nietzsche adds, to be ready to sacrifice men for one's cause, oneself not accepted. Here the German anarchist reminds us of his philosophy of murder again. Like Nietzsche, like the papacy, like Stalin, Nietzsche teaches that freedom is having the will to eliminate anyone who stands in the way, even oneself. Contrasted with this nonsense is the Bible's glorious teaching concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, vicarious sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus was a means to freedom for the elect. Christ died to set his people free from their sin, for, quote, Sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord, end quote. Romans chapter 5, verse 21. The Bible also says, quote, 
knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. You should pay attention to this, for the Bible's teaching here is superior to that of Nietzsche's. Nietzsche believes that men should kill and even commit suicide in order to obtain freedom, while Christ, who is free, came and willingly submitted himself to the horrors of the cross in order to obtain freedom for his people. Nietzsche's teaching requires one to sin, while Christ never sinned, but actually fulfilled the law for us. Nietzsche's teaching is motivated by hate, while Christ is motivated by love. The free men, according to Nietzsche, are warriors who delight in war and triumph, and who tread underfoot all those who they deem to be of no worth. This hatred of men and lust for violence are not the qualities of free men, but actually they are the qualities of slaves. The Bible says, and I quote, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. End quote. Romans chapter 6 verse 16. Nietzsche ends this particular discussion by rationally claiming that freedom is something one has and has not. He comes to this conclusion after pondering the notion that man must overcome great danger and obstacles in order to win his freedom. One must overcome their captor to be free. If another were to free the captive, then the former captive, not having overcome his captor, is really no better off. This is simply the old Pelagian mentality the world has always taught. This humanism refuses to consider that some people are unable to win their freedom, though another can win it for them. The biblical teaching of legal surety and ransom must be ignored by this type of humanism. The truth is that God's elect are not capable of freeing themselves from sin, death, and even the devil. This is why the Bible says, quote, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. End quote. John chapter 8, verse 36. It was Christ Jesus who overcame for us, paid the ransom for us by his suffering and death, and set us free. Furthermore, it is only because Christ set us free that we can live free. I once asked the great Calvinist John W. Robbins for the definition of freedom. He answered, and I quote, Freedom is the rule of God's law, the perfect law of liberty. End quote. Dutch Calvinist Herman Hoeksema also knew the true definition of freedom. He wrote, I quote, Freedom does not consist in this, that man emancipates himself from God and his law, that he declares his independence from the Lord of all, that he thinks as he pleases and wills as he pleases and acts accordingly. For this is not freedom, but licentiousness. In such a state, man purposes to make his own God and determine for himself what is good and what is evil. But true freedom is the inner harmony of man's heart and mind and will and whole life with the law of God. That man is truly free who has the law of God written in his heart. Whence are the issues of life? Who has his delight in the law? Whose thinking and willing, whose longing and desires, whose works and whose deeds are in perfect accord with that law? As the poet of Psalm 119 has it, And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law continually for ever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. Psalm 119 verses 43 through 45. That man is free whose inmost heart is in accord with this law of God and who is motivated by the love of God in all his thinking and willing in his whole life. End quote. Reform Dogmatics, chapter 4, page 2.